It's great to be here, Katarina, in your studio, in your working space. And I think since we are here, let us speak about your working situation here. So how do you start? Is there a working routine? Are there any rituals that are important for you for starting to work? How, what's happening in, in here usually? Well, um, I don't have any rituals. I find that exactly uh, too much, actually, because I, I think there is already so much discipline in the work itself. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the rules that I have to start with, they maybe are the ritualizing procedure in a sense. But what I do need to, I, I mean, there are things that make it easier for me to work, that help me to do, mm -hmm. to be in a good condition. And they are very simple things, so I have like. to... Share, share sleep, them with sleep us. really well. Mm -hmm. It's super important, <laughs> and I like the this, uh, the time before falling asleep and waking up. So they are really really important things. I don't like to be woken up by an alarm clock, for example, mm -hmm. that disrupts uh, like a phase of where thinking and dreaming and not being so clear about a programmed day work mm -hmm. uh, is intermingling and I like that a lot. And that's very often where I get a glimpse of the things that are really interesting for me that I, that I want to know more about. And so that is an important thing for me. And I also like um, very simple simplifications in my life. So I like very simple food. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is too complicated food <laughs> during my um, painting time makes me too engaged in it, you know. Too so, much of a distraction. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So that is not the issue to... So the, the idea is to tune in with a certain kind of mindset and not mm. be... It's more the mindset, yeah, that's true. And it is not a conceptual um, program that makes it easier for me. It is rather... Um, a readiness to then see what I can do with these very also simplified tools I have, which then can get complicated during, or com yeah, can get complex during the work process. So I like the condition, uh, the mind uh, condition, but also the condition of the studio has to be really somehow clear or clean. Mm -hmm. I like, as you can see in this workspace, it's only buckets with color, and um, a lot my, of buckets with yeah, that is true. And my, and my, my tools. Um, but other than that, um, I like to move easily around. You know, I like to have everything uh, like um, absolutely um, unhinged. Uh, you know, in a sense, I like the body to be soft. I like my body to <laughs> be not. Um, yeah, to, to be, not, the muscles have to be soft, you know. Uh, I like to move a little beforehand as if I make, play air guitar, so I move uh, somehow <laughs> through the space, things like that, you know. But then once I start working, um, I like the time frame also. I like to have time um, be uh, undisturbed. That is something that I find very important. So, so you don't know, what, it doesn't have to end at some point, but it's sort of open. Yeah, I know that I have certain um, ranges of uh, very involved concentration or readiness to do something, maybe two or three hours. I don't go like for hours and hours and hours and then I don't forget to eat or to drink. That's not happening in my case. I'm, um, An early bird or owl? Um, can be both, uh, but early, I like the early uh, time of the day. I like the scent in the air and... The light. So your work is also very bodily work and you mm. have already mentioned the tools you work with. You work on a very large scale. What are the steps that take you there? Do you start sort of small in planning and then sort of get large during the process or you start large? How? What are the steps? Um, yeah, it is almost like um, a wave continuum. You know, I have moments where I have I really love to do uh, smaller works, mm -hmm. and that is ma mostly after periods of doing very large work. Mm -hmm. So I like the the movement between these two extremes very much. And um, then also you have to see that I'm having a studio practice with um, works that happen outside the studio in museums or institutions or spaces that I've been uh, shown and given to uh, think about and to kind of think about how my work could inter twine with a given 
and there I work with models uh, mm -hmm. of different scale. Mm -hmm. I start with one to 100 and then one to uh, 25, sometimes one to 10, you know. So there can be a very minute planning process and that has to do with the fact that I work with a team yeah. and I have to show what I'm thinking yeah. and we have to organize uh, all sorts of uh, instruments and meta and, you know, uh, I, s I saw yeah. the models when we worked in yeah, some of the yeah, models, yeah. but there's, I guess a lot of people when they think of large scale painting, they imagine there is a kind of sketching phase and then it gets mm. transferred. Is there anything like that or you no. work directly on the canvas? No, there is no transfer. I'm really opposed in my case for my kind of uh, thinking to the um, uh, transfer of a visual uh, concept, mm -hmm. you know, I, it's very rarely I sketch. I do make very spontaneously maybe little um, notes that are visual, that is absolutely so, but um, I like to work in the one-to-one -one mode. You have invented your own technique and since we don't watch you painting right now, maybe you tell <laughs> us a little bit about how the, can how the paint actually gets on the canvas. What's your technique? How, where does it come from? I mean, I, I use all sorts of instruments and as a painter you always have an instrument in a sense, be it your body or um, a tool, a paintbrush, and I use a spray gun, an airless spray gun, which is actually like a large stick and on the tip of it the, the paint is released and um, I've been using it for many, many years. Mainly it came from working in space, so it has the function of making me larger. So like a ladder, you know, you go move your body high up in the air so I can actually move my spraying tool really far away from the body and hit places that I wouldn't be able to reach. So I have a very a close relationship of the eye movement and the, the brush movement, the paintbrush movement in a sense. So it's not, nothing else but a paintbrush for me, but it's an air gun. And does that mean because there are these great photographs of you um, just almost like an astronaut mm -hmm. in complete gear, mm. working gear. Is that something you have to put on every time you work with the Yeah, spray you need gun? a mask because the, the, the dust is really um, unhealthy. You shouldn't have too much in your lungs, I guess. And, um, but the dust is something that is so amazing about that tool. It allows me to have a range of um, color uh, aggregation if you want, right? So it can be very uh, just dots as if printed by an inkjet printer or it can be very sharp lines as if done by a pelt, felt pen. And I came to use the and love the, the instrument because it is actually coming from outside the um, technicality of painting mm -hmm. in a sense. It comes from an industrial process and it comes from an activity that is uh, functioning in an everyday life and has nothing to do with a pictorial space in the first place. So I'd like to intertwine these, do something within the uh, tradition and the knowledge of painting mm -hmm. that is not coming from there. So I look at the paint, at the air gun like a painter and I look at the painting like a house painter, you know, in a sense. So I have these two perspectives coming together with this uh, tool. So the tool does slow and the technique, they do have to disappear during the process. That's yeah. absolutely important. So as much as we talk about the technique, you know, in the end, uh, it's as if you talk to a string, uh, a violinist, why do you have um, a wire on a resonating yes. box? You know, yes. in the end, that's the condition and that is then not important once you hear the music. I guess it's a kind of melting between body and tool, maybe something that Freud would have um, called prothesen god, something that comes together and that you forget actually that it's something that's not your body during the process. Yeah, I do transform the tool yeah. through the process into something that it is not. I think that's maybe then, I mean, this kind of transformative activity that I think is the basis of art in a sense. So you, you discover alternatives all the time in yeah. your uh, uh, creative thinking. And that's what we do as artists. And I think that is every speck of your um, 
thinking that is then going into the body or the tools or the way you work with other people together has this transformative aspect. Otherwise it is becoming uh, a demonstration. It is isolating and saying this is the technique, this is the surface and yeah. this is this. And I think this, um, this threat of transformative energy has to um, affect everything in the process. And I think that's what actually is also a specific uh, thing about process. You know, that a process is not the one after the other. And but it's can, an open... But it is actually like um, dispersing its consequences into areas that are maybe not even so clear to you. Yeah. And while you do it, you see which areas are actually affected. Yeah. Yeah. I like I like how you put it uh, to say that to discover alternatives is sort of what makes the process interesting. And I'm, I was thinking, sitting here in front of or near to the works you have recently done, um, it reminded me we are in an amazing time period. I think where a lot of alternatives are being discovered, also in art history. And actually, one artist that has been rediscovered as an alternative recently, is a British artist called Georgiana Houghton. And she came to my mind immediately when I saw your work. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, is she a person, an artist that inspires you? Or am I completely sort of wildly associating something that has nothing to do with the works we see? Oh, absolutely. I, I ran into her work. Um, in London, I think 2016, there mm -hmm. was a show in the Courtauld Courtauld Institute. Institute and um, that was the first time I saw her work in person and saw also such a vast number of works mm -hmm. and I was, uh, of course, um, smitten. I thought they were amazing and also I was a little jealous that she could do it so <laughs> small. It's true, they are about this size, yeah, right? Yeah, and I like the mathematical implications they had. I mean, the, the line that is completely um, creating this um, bent space that is a, a, a torsion of any kind of grid thinking yeah. that early in, uh, in, uh, uh, in her time. And, uh, and I was also struck by then sometimes the faces of Jesus uh, being knit, knitted into the whole web that she created. And that was something that struck me as strange and I was almost um, a little bit uh, against it and then I took my students to that show and mm -hmm. they were they loved the fact that she did both you know yeah. that she had this kind of very intricate spatial proposal that would then allow for a um, pictorial, uh, pictorial icon in it you know, like a face or a portrait or the mirror of an image that is maybe yourself you know with eyes and mouth and nose yeah looking at something yeah so yeah no i got very very inspired by her but um also on the other hand um and the tenderness she has in it the care into the smallest little yeah they're um, amazing words um, very and very tender very yeah delicate. almost like a root system yeah. that are going into the last little end of the of nutrients being transported someplace you know nervous very nervous yeah. um I thought they were, whereas my work has a lot to do with the first initiative of physical impact. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that is also something where I can see there's another end of the spectrum where I can't go, where I can't reach, uh, where, where I don't have the, um, the detailed knowledge in my uh, body uh, facets in a sense, you know, because mine is the full impact out of the center of the body that is almost um, ending in uh, an attack that I then transform into a colorful mm -hmm. uh, event, but it is almost the, uh, the idea of attacking is a very important uh, ingredient in my work and I can't see that in her work at all. So that was interesting for me to see. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah, because there is, yeah. There there's is no anger in her work. You know? There is no anger. That it's is, true, but uh, I mean, there's a lot of boldness yeah, um, yeah, yeah, in her work. Yeah. And maybe not in her work, but sort of in the, in the entire practice around it. I mean, she exhibited in 1871. She rented her own gallery and put it on Bond Street and made this kind of abstract work that didn't have any, I don't know, theoretical frame in her time. People didn't know what they were seeing. And so there was a lot of boldness, and she but she also describes it in very delicate, 
sort of tender prose, what she's doing. She's supported by her spirits and she does it and she decides for it. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, there's obviously, there's also a lot of boldness in your work and um, it also has to do with scale. What does size do for you? What's, what's important about sort of the, the large formats for you? Yeah, that is an interesting question because there are two, I think, uh, factors coming together over the time of my practice. One is that I've always had a very natural relationship to taking a space for granted, mm -hmm. be it as a child or as a grown uh, a teenage. So I would always take for granted that I can do something there or there or maybe larger works. Even as a kid, I put all these glued together, lots of things, you know, to have a larger surface or... So this idea that um, there, is, there is no limit to being someplace, even though it's officially not mine. Mm -hmm. That was, for example, um, always there, I think. But then, and also um, a natural understanding of size being my gesture, mm -hmm. my natural, my habitat mm -hmm. being a large range, going places over there or here or there, and that could all be making sense in a way because I'm going there and putting it together. So it's just adequate. Yeah, yeah, the attitude was, <laughs> net, uh, was a given, but then, then uh, of course, it, with doing it, it uh, you discover uh, more deeply why you do it. Yeah. And that changes also your attitude towards it. And I think that the large format, of course, is something that is, um, you do, the same you do in a small one, but with much less work, you know. So the idea of expanding is actually a slow motion movement. It mm -hmm. is actually not making more complex things in larger spaces, and it's just the opposite. It's like taking things apart. Mm -hmm. And as you take a suitcase apart, you need more <laughs> space, you know. <laughs> so true. that is actually the activity also. So it's not only taking space that's not given to me, yeah. which is also something that has to do with the fact of I'm not okay with not having that space, you know, yeah. it's almost like I take it, yeah. you know, writing it out is like I'm having it, yeah. but it's also taking painting apart yeah. in a sense. And the other one was discovering by doing so that my work is actually not happening on the surface, but in front of it. Yeah. So, which is difficult to discover when you have a small studio with a um, one by two meter painting, because then it's almost as if the one by two meter surface is your a realm of activity mm -hmm. and that is what I discovered not the case in my practice yeah so it's actually in front of it yeah and then the residue somehow lands on the surface yeah so it's coming from outside you know it's not coming from inside out I very much like the suitcase metaphor it makes me feel you more... seem to know that <laughs> <laughs> yes it makes me yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and now it sort of turns it into something else sometimes you think oh or when you want to find something sometimes you have to take things away and say it was oh, somewhere true. it was yes. somewhere what, where is it you know yeah and that is not um that is kind of a thing that i think also has and to do with it the always piece. seemed to me like a disorderly process now i think i can like this process of you know? Yeah, or you paint <laughs> more, you go on and you go, well, maybe I should actually paint here, you know. Yeah. What, what would it be like if it was going there? And yeah. then all, before you know it, you're 50 meters moved away from yeah. where you started. Yeah. And that is kind of a, a very interesting um, experience. Very good. Mm. Um, when you exhibited similar work to these um, in the gallery, you also had, you gave a concert there. How is music and painting, or music and watching, for you connected? Music and watching? People sort of experienced the music and watched oh, your I paintings. See. Yeah, I don't know how that works. Okay. You know? um, I don't think of what we do there as music either. Okay. You know, really, I, I mean, I, the juxtaposition of painting or music, I, no, I can't relate to that. Okay, uh, so why, why have a concert? Why at in all? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, to, um, I started with um, Stefan Schneider early on mm -hmm. uh, when we, we did something like this. We did, gave a talk and when we thought maybe that's not so adventurous, let's stand on ladders and talk. And then we thought, oh, maybe we should also <laughs> do some, uh, something together while we talk. So we started to play a piece by Lamonte Young and we invited um, a little orchestra with uh, instruments from the Balkan. 
Mm -hmm. So we played it not on synthesizer, but on lutes and mm -hmm. little guitars and flutes. And but I had a synthesizer, mm -hmm. and because I couldn't play it, they marked the keys, and I, I played see. the quint, you know, like. And I played as a kid um, in an orchestra. I really liked the activity of being together and doing something together. Whether it was music, I couldn't really see because I didn't hear it. You know, I only heard my own sound. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really hard to hear the other with mm -hmm. yourself, mm -hmm. you know. So discovering the talk and the dialogue and doing the music together, we thought, ah, that's actually like talking. And then we started to play in other installations. Mm -hmm. And it was really like talking. We did never rehearse. We just started. I had a little analog synthesizer and I was absolutely uninhibited. I used everything and tried it all and something came out of there. Mm -hmm. And then we did it again, and then sometimes we did talks with it or m little movies that run alongside the talk and the play. So this was the first time we invited other people in, and it was more like a sound battery for the whole thing. So okay. we thought we have to be all together on a very small spot, so from there it can kind of disperse into the space and reach everywhere in the space. So the vibrations would go okay. places, so the walls would vibrate. It's about taking even more space. Yeah, it is actually really about filling the space with something that is um, has a body impact, yeah. that resonates very strongly with your body, yeah. and that is accidental, and that is unrehearsed, yeah. and that has no possibility of being replicated. Yeah. So all these things matter when we meet. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's move to a project that's not within this studio, although I guess it resonates with your studio as well. Um, you, have co you have founded a foundation called Wunderblock. Um, and Wunderblock is dedicated to um, explore the meanings and functions of painting. Do we underestimate what painting is? Does it need to be further explored? Oh, yes, it does, from my point of view, of course, you know. I think it is one of the oldest um, user surfaces we have. We have so much information about it, which is exciting. And yet, it is also one of the most simple things we do, even when we are small. I don't know whether people nowadays get in touch with painting from day one, but it is very accessible. It doesn't need electricity or, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it is um, even a primordial tool, a primordial cultural tool, even to put cream on your body is not very uh, dissimilar, you know, or to scratch yourself or to scribble something. Uh, these little movements, these vibrations our bodies have, they lead into um, um, information that can be put down on a piece of paper or in the sand or wherever. And I would like to support the most adventurous uh, ways of painting, you know, how, where could it go, how, what could it do in our society, how can it be actualized mm -hmm. to be a, a, a significant player. I mean, it is not the only one anymore that is um, the source of images, of course, but it's a very specific one that has a time frame that is extraordinary. It's not uh, the one after the other, the continuous, it is a cluster, and the cluster of time is such an amazing way to have as a concept of your uh, ability to um, listen, to um, organize problems, you know, to get to live with antagonistic players that we have more and more in our world. How do we commune with people that are really in a paradox vague way totally against one another? And I think painting has a thinking mode for that kind of task. You know. What is the most surprising thing you have found out about painting recently? Oh, recently? Or it could uh, be also older. Maybe if it still surprises you, it's fine if it's older. Yeah, I think in my own practice with what I do and what I sometimes observe in other people's work, and it's not only painting that I'm interested in, of course. I'm interested in a lot of visual sensations, but um, It is certainly um, that it is really different every day you look at it. Mm -hmm. So it is um, also looking at an older work. You sometimes think, I haven't seen that, and you have seen it many times, for yeah. example. And, I mean, also for you, uh, having worked with the work of Filmer of Clint, 
and I've seen many shows now of hers, and they always look different. Yes, I and always discover something new. You discover something new, and that uh, that is possible with every speck of our life. But I think uh, um, that um, well, my my thinking mode, of course, is painting, and that is making me more alert, more clear that. Um, the changes are so radical from day to day that we experience. Katharina, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. That was thank amazing. You. <laughs>